Greetings and peace. In this fourth video, I would like to share with you more depth of what the New Testament Scripture says about the Mass. In the last video, looking at the Old Testament witnesses, we did touch on a couple parts of the New Testament, right? The New, uh, the Last Supper institution of the Eucharist by Jesus, and also John chapter 6, where Jesus talks after the feeding of the multitude with the loaves, after he talks, that was done on Passover, and then he talks about how this is new manna. So I would like to continue with the New Testament witnesses to the Mass and the Eucharist outside of those two passages. And a lot of what I said in the last video, I'm claiming that a lot of the archetype was set forward the pattern of what Jesus is doing in the New Covenant in the Eucharist in the Exodus, in the ratification of the Covenant by Moses, in the Manna, and in the Passover. But even to date, you're kind of taking my word right now, right? But my word is also informed by theologians and the traditions and the teachings of the Church. But it's very interesting, I'd like to start this video just on a little summary of how the New Testament itself actually testifies to this very thing I am saying, that the New Covenant is patterned on the Old Covenant, and the Jewish people at that time really saw that parallel. And so, where I'd like to start is really from the letter to the Hebrews. The Hebrew people, of course, were the Jewish people who were steeped in the language, the traditions, the symbology, the rituals of the Jewish people, the sacrifices, the temple, the cult. And so this letter speaks in that language to them about what Christ has done. And so I'm going to go from just a few passages in chapters 8 and 9. Chapter 8, verse 1. The author says, the main point of what has been said in this is that we have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle that the Lord, not man, set up. Remember how in the last video I said Moses was taken up onto the top of the mountain, which we kind of equate with because we believe it was he was taken up into heaven and ate with God in his presence but then was commanded to build a sanctuary and that sanctuary was like he was shown on the mountain Hebrews is testifying to that it goes on in verse 5 they worship talking about the Old Testament now they worship in a copy in a shadow of the heavenly sanctuary as Moses was warned when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For he says, See that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. And now he has obtained so much more excellent a ministry as he is mediator of a better covenant, enacted on a better promise. Again, Christ is enacting and going to enter the true sanctuary, which is heaven, in his resurrection and ascension and win for us uh, reconciliation with God, becoming again members of that true sanctuary that Moses built only as a replica. Um, a footnote there on the slide that you're seeing is actually, this comes from the bishop's website of the scripture, and it goes on to verify that the sanctuary, the Greek term could mean holy things, but bears the meaning of sanctuary elsewhere in Hebrews. It's the true tabernacle, the heavenly tabernacle, that the Lord set up, in contrast with the earthly tabernacle that Moses set up in the desert. Okay, moving on. Chapter 9 in Hebrews, the worship of the first covenant. Verse 1 through 5. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was constructed, the outer one, in which there was the lampstand, the table, the bread of offering. This is called the holy place. And behind the second veil was the tabernacle called the holy of holies, in which were the gold altar of incense, and the ark of the covenant, 
entirely covered with gold. In it were the gold jar containing the manna, the staff of Aaron that had sprouted, and the tablets of the covenant. And it was above there that the cherubim of glory overshadowing the place of expiation. Now is not the time to speak of these details, and neither will I. But the point is, is everything we've kind of talked, a lot of what we talked about, the tabernacle, the bread of presence, the holy of holies, the manna in the tabernacle, these are things that Christ was referring to when he was instituting the Last Supper. And so verse 6, it says, With these arrangements for worship, the priests, in performing their service, again in the Old Testament, go into the outer tabernacle repeatedly. So they do it over and over. But, verse 11, when Christ came as the high priest of the good things that have come to be, passing through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made by hands, that is, not belonging to this creation, he entered once and for all into the sanctuary, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption, for he is the mediator of the new covenant. So Jesus, in the pattern of the old covenant, establishes the new covenant, but it's the perfect sacrifice. It's the true sanctuary that we partake in and worship in. Continuing, the next slide, verses 18 and 24. Thus, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. And when every commandment has been proclaimed by Moses to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats, together with water and crimson wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has enjoined upon you. In the same way he sprinkled also the tabernacle, and all the vessels of worship with its blood, according to the law, almost everything is purified by blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. So remember when we talked about the ratification of the covenant by Moses in that ceremony? Hebrews is saying that's what Christ did at the Last Supper, and at his passion, death, and resurrection. His sacrifice, his blood, has given us true forgiveness of sins. He's entered the sanctuary of heaven, and that sacrifice in the Eucharist, in the worship, the new liturgy, is presented to us once and for all for us to participate in through all time and space, not done over and over like the priests of the old covenant or the old worship. And finally, verse 24, For Christ did not enter into a sanctuary made by hands, a copy of the true one, but heaven itself, that he might now appear before God on our behalf, not that he might offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters each year into the sanctuary with blood that is not his own. If that were so, he would have had to suffer repeatedly from the foundation of the world, but now once for all has appeared at the end of the ages to take away sin by his sacrifice. And so that's one of the critiques of non-Catholic Christians about the Mass, they think if it's really his flesh and blood, if it's really what you guys say, is that means you're killing him over and over again. But it's clear that that's not what we believe. It really is his one sacrifice present, but God knows no time. So this sacrifice is trans-historical. It's that one sacrifice present and available to us for all time. Now I'd like to go to the end of Luke's Gospel, one of my favorite passages about the Eucharist and about the Mass, but at first you really don't realize that. It's an appearance of the resurrected Jesus on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples who are leaving Jerusalem. It's verses, um, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Let's read it together. Now on that very day, two of them were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem, called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, 
What are you discussing as you walk along? And they stopped, looking downcast. And then one of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place in these days? And he replied to them, What sort of things? And they said to him, The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. And some of the women from our group, however, have astounded us that they were at the tomb early in the morning, but they did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. And then some of those who went with us went to the tomb and found things just as the woman had described, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Let's stop right there. This passage is really speaking to us, the generations to come after Jesus and the early disciples. In John's Gospel, Jesus appears in the upper room and Thomas is not there, and so the disciples tell him, we've seen the Lord, and he says, I won't believe it until I touch his wounds, and so the next week Jesus comes back, shows him, and Thomas then says, my Lord and my God, and recognizes Jesus is truly risen, it's the Lord. And then Jesus said, Thomas, you saw because you, you believe because you saw, but blessed are those who believe without seeing. What a comforting statement Jesus is thinking about. The, the Gospel writer is making the point that Jesus had a plan for all generations and wanted us all to believe. This is what we're seeing here more powerfully, actually, in this Road to Emmaus story. Those disciples on the road were right where we are on our way, on our life. We've heard the testimony about who Jesus was. We have the hopes that he can be our Savior. We heard that he was crucified, but we heard the tomb was empty, and we've only heard it from witnesses. And now we are challenged to believe because of that. And let's go on. This is how we are to learn to believe that Jesus is truly present with us to the end of time. And so, I will continue back with uh, where I left off. I'll start again and check at verse 25. Oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. And as they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression he was going on further. But they urged him, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. And so he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, gave it to them. And with that their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. And then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? And so they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. And then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how they came were made to know him in the breaking of the bread. How do we know Jesus? How do we know he truly rose from that grave? He explained the scriptures 
to those disciples. And every part of those scriptures that referred to him, just like we did in the last video, Moses and the prophets, Jesus explained the scriptures so that their hearts were burning. In the first part of the Mass, the first part of the Liturgy of the Word, we listen to the scriptures. And then it's explained to us by a preacher, by a priest, but through the Holy Spirit, God hopefully is explaining that to us. And as we listen to those scriptures, it's been the testimony of the church that in the power of the Holy Spirit, we see them and perceive them, can perceive them as not just simply words, but as Jesus revealing himself, Jesus explaining them to us. And so the scripture then leads us to a deeper encounter, one beyond words, and that is in the breaking of the bread. Jesus took the bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, gave the bread to his disciples. Those are the words we hear at every single Mass. And then their eyes were open, and they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. Right? That statement is the experience of the early church. They recognized the risen Lord in the breaking of the bread. And then he vanished from their sight. Why was that? Because just as they were unable to see him on the road as a stranger next to them, he appeared in a way that was unfamiliar with them. At the breaking of the bread, he briefly appeared in a way that they did recognize and then vanished so that they would learn this now is the appearance of the risen Christ for all generations to come. The bread broken, the wine poured out, the body and blood, the flesh of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, his true presence, the Eucharist. And so this is the way he appears to us after the ascension and resurrection. This is the way he appears to us 2,000 years later, and for the church of all time, from the very beginning, the first day of the resurrection. So I'd like to go on. That term, the breaking of the bread, becomes in a way a code word for the Eucharist. And you will see that the Luke continues to tell us in the Acts of the Apostles, the history of the early church, that right from the beginning, the community practiced the breaking of the bread regularly. And so Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, let's read it together. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their property and possessions and divide them all according to each one's need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple area and to breaking bread in their homes. They ate their meals with exultation and sincerity of heart, praising God, and they joined favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The practice of the prayers, the liturgy of the word, in the temple, because they were in Jerusalem, and then going back to their houses to have the breaking of the bread, because that was not part of the temple worship at that time. So this practice then, of establishing a liturgy, a way that the community worships, is something that not only Luke testifies to from the early church, it's not only something Luke testified to from his gospel, the day of the resurrection, but this is something Paul, who established many churches, one of the greatest missionaries, also taught the churches in which he established to do. It comes to us through a very different and unusual way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is actually reprimanding the community for some abuses. But in this reprimand and the abuses, we're going to see a powerful testimony that Paul, from the very beginning, established the Eucharist as the way the community wants to worship. And so this is from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 29. Subtitled, An Abuse at Corinth. In giving this instruction, I do not praise the fact that your meetings are doing more harm than good. First of all, I hear that when you meet as a church, there are divisions among you, 
And to a degree, I believe it. There have to be factions among you in order that also those who are approved among you may become known. When you meet in one place then, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating each one goes ahead with his own supper, and one goes hungry while the other gets drunk. Do you not have houses in which you can eat and drink? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and make those who have nothing feel ashamed? What can I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this matter I do not praise you. Right? He's given a stern reprimand. But then he goes on. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was handed over, took bread, and after he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Therefore, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. I was hesitant to include that verse. It's very harsh and scary almost. But I have to include it because in that harshness, in that warning, you see how real Paul is saying that the Eucharist really is. How truly it is the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. Not just symbolic. Or if you don't understand what it is or you disrespect what it is, it can harm you. That's harsh to think about. But I think what's going on here is the very idea that we've talked about before. When you come into God's presence, right, the goodness of God is going to burn away any imperfections. And so it was always believed that if you come into God's presence, you would die. But only in Christ Jesus are we able to live, even in God's presence. Because he is God's presence revealed to us gently so that we have time to recognize our sins and repent. And so what we're saying is the Eucharist is the true presence of God. You can't come into the presence of God unworthily. You must recognize your sins and repent. As imperfectly as we do, we need to at least be trying that, at least recognize that this is truly God, and we are being nourished by His perfection and drawn away from our sinfulness into Christ's likeness, being unified with Him. But we can't do that unless we're serious about that conversion. It's serious medicine, and so we need to be serious about recovering from our sickness. And so you see, the point of this passage is the Eucharist is handed on to Paul by Jesus. That's incredible. We don't know for sure whether he's referring to the teaching of the apostles or Jesus himself, who taught Paul much after he appeared to him in the resurrected form, because Paul never knew Jesus before that, before his death and resurrection. But Paul is saying, I'm handing this on, this is the way to worship, and it truly is God's very presence with us, the way he called us to worship. I could go on and on about other things in the New Testament, but I choose to really stop there with the New Testament witness to the Eucharist. In addition, to what the New Testament says about the Mass. I want to briefly look at some additional writings outside of Scripture in the New Testament period, but also just after the New Testament period, called the Fathers of the Church. There's a document called the Didache that comes from Antioch, about the year 50 A.D. to 110 A.D. The Didache really means the teaching of the Apostles. And in that teaching, it instructs that the Church should gather for the Eucharist. 
And the instructions include that the Eucharist is the sacrifice of the Lord, and that on the Lord's day the faithful should gather for the breaking of the bread. Here's the full quote. On the Lord's own day, gather yourselves together and break bread and give thanks. First, confessing your transgressions, that your sacrifice may be pure. And then he goes on to give a very poetic Eucharistic prayer. That's the prayer that the priest says over the bread and the wine. St. Ignatius of Antioch, bishop, around 107 AD. And you notice Antioch is where they were first called Christians, right? We get that from the Acts of the Apostles. In several writings, St. Ignatius will say much about the Eucharist. He says, Take care then to have but one Eucharist, for there is one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ, and one cup to show forth the unity of his blood. One altar, as there is one bishop, along with the priests and deacons, my fellow servants. In another letter to the Church of Samaria, Smyrna, representing or reprimanding some of those who didn't have the belief in the true presence of the Eucharist, he's saying about them, from the Eucharist and prayer they hold aloof because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then a little bit later, certainly after the New Testament was concluded, Justin Martyr from Samaria, in about 155 AD, very interesting, the Roman government who was suspicious of Christians because Christianity was not yet legal, um, Justin Martyr wrote a letter to the Roman officials because they were concerned about rumors they had heard that the Christians were meeting in secret and performing cannibalism. And so he gives a lengthy description of what Christians do when they gather. And I wanted to read it for you. It says, On the day we call the sun, all who dwell in the city or country gather in the same place. The memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets are read, as much as time permits. And when the reader has finished, he who presides over those gathered admonishes and challenges them to imitate these beautiful things. Then we all rise together and offer prayers for ourselves and for all others wherever they may be, so that we may be found righteous by our life and actions, and faithful to the commandments, so as to obtain eternal salvation. And when the prayers are concluded, we exchange a kiss. Then someone brings bread, and a cup of water mixed with wine, a cup of water and wine mixed together, to him who presides over the brethren. He takes them and offers praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and for a considerable time he gives thanks, Eucharistia in Greek, that we have been judged worthy of these gifts. And when he has concluded the prayers and thanksgiving, all present give voice to an acclamation by saying, Amen. And when he who presides has given thanks, and the people have responded, those whom we call deacons give to those present the Eucharistic bread, wine and water, and take them to those who are absent. And then in that same letter he continues, he says, the food that has been made the Eucharist by the prayer of his word, meaning God's word spoken through the priest or the presider, and which nourishes our flesh and blood by assimilation, is both the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. And then the letter further goes on to explain that the Passover sacrifice and all the temple sacrifices were mere foreshadowings of this one sacrifice of Jesus Christ and its representation in the liturgy. And so you see, 
Today, this video has shown from testimony both in the New Testament and outside the New Testament, in the same time the New Testament was formed and just after, the following points. At the Last Supper, Jesus is doing an intentional establishment of a new form of worship for all time to come. Just as the first Passover, a liturgy was implemented before the actual event, so too he's making the liturgy, which will be the memorial of his passion, death, and resurrection. Just as he had hinted to the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, when he said there would be a new way of worship, when she asked where the right purple place and the right, right way to worship was. Second point, this new way of worship is patterned on the old way using the same language, the same symbols. However, it is not simply just another form of the old. It's superior, and everything that the old was done was meant to foreshadow and teach us what would truly happen with Christ Jesus. And so the previous ones were rituals, but the current one is the actual representation of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. It's our participation in the life of God flesh and the blood which contains the life. It's our participation in the liturgy of heaven. It was, third point, it was commanded by Jesus and done from the very beginning. Right? This isn't something humans invented and came up with later. It was done on the day of the resurrection. It was done in the Acts of the Apostles we hear by the early church. We heard that it was done by St. Paul in the churches that he established, and he taught people to do it. And it was done by the church just after the New Testament period, the church fathers, and ever since then, from the beginning, for 2,000 years, this has been the one form of worship established by Jesus Christ for the church in the New Covenant. And, fourth point, it is not symbolic, right? In the breaking of the bread, the early church recognized the risen Lord. It was that representation of Christ's one sacrifice, His true flesh and blood, communicated to us that divine and risen life. And then, fifth point, it was the central part of the communal life. Done on the day of the Lord, the whole community from the city to the country gathered together to have the one worship, and the Eucharist was taken by the deacons to those not present, unable to come. It was the center, the source, and the summit of their lives. And so I'd like to, I'd like to conclude with a very beautiful insight that I think is true. And I don't know if every theologian would agree with this. But you see in the entire body of Scripture, bookends. We see God's plan laid out from Genesis to Revelation. In Genesis, in chapter 3, after the fall of man, it's predicted that the woman's offspring would be at odds or enmity or at war with the serpent's offspring and her offspring would bruise the serpent's head while it struck only at the heel. And then chapter 3 concludes with humanity being expelled from the Garden of Eden and angels sealing the entrance so that humans who are now sinful would not be able to get back and eat the fruit of the tree of life at the center of the garden and hence live forever. And so we hear that at the fall that God has planned salvation, but for now they are cut off from the fruit of the tree of life. In the Gospel of John, right, the center of the scripture, if you will, we hear that Jesus is buried in a garden, a new tomb in the garden. And when he rose, Mary Magdalene mistook him for the gardener. He calls her woman, harking back to Genesis in the garden and the first woman. In Matthew's Gospel, as the women come to the tomb, an earthquake happens, an angel comes down from heaven and rolls open the entrance to the tomb and invites them to enter to see that Jesus is risen and not there. The angels themselves are opening up 
the garden of paradise, through the tomb, through the death of Jesus and his resurrection, so that we may share in it. And finally then in the book of Revelation, the entire book of Revelation, Scott Hamm shows us and teaches us, is a heavenly liturgy that we're invited into. And St. John in ecstasy on the island of Patmos it says, and right at the beginning, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 10, on the Lord's day. This was Sunday. This was a mass he was probably at, but we don't know. But the book describes that heavenly liturgy, liturgy and then it goes on in chapter 2, verse 7, to say that those who have proven victorious, I will feed from the tree of life in God's paradise. The liturgy of the Mass is our participation in God's paradise, in heaven, where we receive the fruit of the tree of life. The tree of life is the cross where Jesus was crucified. But the fruit of the tree of life is its saving remedy, the fruit, flesh and blood of Jesus Christ present in the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the fruit of the tree of life that we're invited to eat. It's the bread of angels. It's the bread of presence of God. It is the new manna come down from heaven, and it leads us to the new promised land, which is heaven. It gives us a foretaste of that heavenly banquet yet to be fulfilled, but we partake in now imperfectly. It is the flesh of the Son of Man given to us to eat, and those who eat it will live forever. And so finally, I'd like to finish with a beautiful quote, still from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 19 through 22. Jesus says, Look, I am standing at the door, knocking. If one of you hears me calling and opens the door, I will come in to share a meal at that person's side. Anyone who proves victorious, I will allow to share my throne. Just as I myself overcome and have taken my seat with my Father on his throne, let anyone who can hear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Jesus is inviting us to come in and have a meal with him. He wants to come in and have a meal with us, just as those disciples on the road to Emmaus invited him to stay and not go on. And he went in and ate with them. This invitation is powerful. As we grow in understanding of what the Eucharist is, I encourage you, and I make this my prayer, Lord, stay with me this day so that I may dine with you and recognize you truly risen in the breaking of the bread. God bless you. The next video, we will really conclude much of what I've gone through in the previous videos. Testimony of saints, testimony of miracles, my own testimony, testimony of the Old Testament Scripture, the New Testament Scripture, the post-New Testament period, and use theology to summarize it all and wrap it up so that we may conclude by having a better understanding of what God did for us in Jesus and how Jesus presents it to us 2,000 years later in the Mass, in the Eucharist. So having a better understanding, then we may more fully participate and then more completely receive its benefits, become one with Him, transformed into His body and blood, His divine life, His likeness. God bless you.